welcome to the thrilling history of the Gunnison country with Dwayne Vandenbush. I'm just going to go over a couple things per usual tonight. Um, if you don't know, my name is Ashley O'Hara. I'm the curator here at the Crested Butte Museum. Um, and we just want to say thank you for joining us tonight for the thrilling history series of the Gunnison country with Dwayne. Um, this series is going to be every single Tuesday at 7 p.m. until Tuesday, uh, December 20th, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also like to start off the night by giving a land acknowledgement. Um, the museum does recognize that we are guests here on this land, historically Ute territory. Uh, Crested Butte has no known uh, place names under the Ute language, but we do acknowledge that the Uncompahgre and the Tabawash Ute were forcibly removed from this area due to the Brno Treaty that was signed. The, location, the locations within which we explore in this series are areas which the Ute have historically used as hunting, gathering, and traveling grounds. Um, these locations that we'll talk about, and we just want to reference that in the acknowledgement. Um, and then despite the many atrocities that were committed, these indigenous communities are still committed to leaving the world a better place than they left it. While we here at the Crested Bay Museum could never do their history justice, uh, we do offer a small exhibit with information on the Paleo Indians, uh, the Ute people, um, also the Bruneau Treaty and the Los Pinos Indian Agency that you can check out. We also strongly suggest that you go and if you ever pass through Montrose to check out the Ute Museum, um, that is through History Colorado and the Ute Tribe. Um, it's also important to realize that land acknowledgements can help educate, it, educate us also important for calls to action. Um, opportunities to help our indigenous communities is to donate to organizations where your money directly helps those communities, such as the American Indian College Fund that helps fund and empower native youth in our country. These actions can lead us towards allyship reconciliation by conducting your own research of native people in your local communities. And there's just a website that if you would like to go on that you can donate and we'll have this up throughout the series. Um, also, if you would like to make a monetary donation to this program or future programming, you can visit our website at crestedbuttemuseum.com. Uh, the museum is currently closed right now, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesdays. Um, open up the rest of the week, and that will go on for the rest of the month of November. Um, also, please join uh, the museum and Dr. Vandenbush on Monday, November 14th at 7 p.m. in person here at the museum. Uh, Dwayne, do you want to let them know what you're going to be talking about? Yeah, you know, it's the 100 year anniversary of the Colorado River Compact, which was signed in Santa Fe, New Mexico on November the 24th, 1922. And of course, with all the water difficulties that we have in the West today, that is the one compact that deals with what we are going through today. So very important to kind of find out what that compact did and what it hopes to do. Yes, absolutely. And I just do want to let everyone know that this program is being recorded and this program will be up on our YouTube page and our website within seven days. Um, if you do have any questions about our this program, you can email me at curator at museum.com or give the museum a call at 970-349-1880. Um, you can also visit our Facebook page. A lot of our events are posted on our Facebook page and our Instagram page as well, or you can sign up for our newsletter on our website. Um, and then we also have a list of our events in the newspaper. Uh, and I do want to give a shout out to our lead sponsors. Uh, this year, we are saying a big thank you to Bud Bush from Bluebird Realty, uh, Kachiever Saloon, and then KOA Dave Taylor. Um, we really appreciate that. Otherwise, I'm not sure we'd be able to pull this one off. Um, and just so you know, we are, Dwayne is going to do his trivia question. Do you want to show him what they're going to win today? Yes, I will. Um... Here, do you want me to hold it? I'll be like We're going to give out a copy of the big book, The Gunnison Country, about 400 pages with photos. So uh, everybody, I hope taking notes because Real. there'll be a big trivia question at the end of the presentation. Yep, we'll have time for questions at the end of the talk, so stay on and then uh, we'll post them in the chat. Okay, Dwayne, I'm going to turn this over to you. All right, everybody, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we are gonna go through eight different sessions on the Gunnison country. Some of the topic next week is gonna be the town of Gunnison. We've said a lot about Crested Butte in the past, but not so much about Gunnison directly. One topic is gonna be on Crested Butte, one on water, one on railroads, one on mining uh, and so on. So next week we'll be on Gunnison. 
Uh, tonight, we're going to take a look at the 10 keys to understanding the Gunnison country. What makes the Gunnison country tick? And before we get started, we're going to define the area known as the Gunnison country. And of course, this is my opinion. So the Gunnison country is that area that goes to Cimarron, 45 miles to the west, 42 miles to the top of Monarch Pass to the east, 50 miles to Marble in the north, and 55 miles to Lake City in the south. That is the area that includes the Gunnison country. And a long time ago in the 1870s and 80s, the Gunnison country was a frontier. And a frontier is designated by about three or four interpretations. It can be a boundary between countries. It can be a area separating wilderness from a settled area, or it can be an unexplained field, uh, an unexplored field. But what we're going to say tonight is that it's a state of mind. And I think that's what the Gunnison country is all about. And that's always what it's been about. So I'm going to start off with a great poem by Arthur Chapman, who wrote this in 1888. And I think the Gunnison country and the area of the Western Slope is very typical of this. It went something like this. Out where the hand clasp is a little stronger. Out where the smile dwells a little longer. That's where the West begins. Out where the sun is a little brighter, where the bonds of home are a wee bit tighter, that's where the West begins. When early people came into the Gunnison country, one person said it was like coming into the land of the hard way eight. And the hard way eight is if you're out at Las Vegas uh, and gambling and you throw two fours, that's an eight. And the odds makers pay off eight to one. And that probably were your chances of success when you came into the Gunnison country very early, about eight to one, the land of the hard way eight. Another interesting story involves a little girl leaving her Kansas farm for the Gunnison country in 1881. When she did that, she looked up in the sky and said to her mother and father, goodbye, God, I'm going to Colorado. And a lot of truth in that. And also Robert Service in a great work, Spell of the Yukon, about Alaska, which could be very typical of the Gunnison country. I have clinched and closed with the naked north. I've learned to defy and defend. Shoulder to shoulder, we have fought it out. Yet the wild must win in the end. And this was a real wild country in the early days. David Wood, the great freighter of the Gunnison country in western Colorado, accosted by a young lady not far from Iola in 1882. And she said, sir, you've been in these parts very long. And David Day eyed her with contemptuous disdain and said, madam, I haul these damn mountains in here. And that's the title of a book written by his daughters about him. And then of course, we come to the great comment of Mark Twain and concerning the mining industry in the Gunnison country and in the West. He said this, a mine is a hole in the ground owned by a liar. And there was a lot of truth to that. The Gunnison country began to open 10 to 12,000 years ago with prehistoric people coming in. We've got a lot of artifacts on top of W Mountain and on Signal Peak and in other areas of the Gunnison country. And then in order, kind of a litany of order came the Ute Indians and then the Spanish and then the fur traders and then the explorers, and then the placer miners, and then the surveyors, and then the hard rock miners. And finally coming in were the skiers and the educators. And one followed the other as they came in. The Gunnison country has experienced a lot of changes in its history, but we're going through some of the biggest today, primarily because of an increased national population, problems in the city, more money, a lot more money, the great beauty of the area, and finally, the ability of people to work out of their own homes. And that is a great challenge that we have in the Gunnison country today because there's an enormous amount of wealth that's moved in and there's a very great difficulty of workers being able to live here. Throughout its history, the Gunnison country has had a number of keys that molded its development. And we're going to take a look at 10 of them today. I'm going to start off with geography. And here is a statistic that I think is very meaningful. The western slope of Colorado has 10% of the state's population, 33% of the land area, 
and 80% of the water. And that means the people ain't where the water is and the water ain't where the people are. There are five Colorados actually that exist in this state and they're all different. The Western Slope, the San Luis Valley, the Eastern Plains, the Front Range, and the Goliath called Denver. Arnold Toynbee, the great historian of England, once said that geography is the great lever of history. History is determined by cold weather, snow, isolation, elevation, aridity, and sunshine, and they have all molded our area. Now, to give you an example of what I'm talking about in history, England was an island civilization, didn't have a whole lot of people, couldn't produce everything it need, was needed. And as a result, England was forced to develop an empire and a great navy. In Greece, 25,000 square miles of tangled mountain ranges running into each other. That meant that Greece could never have a national government. It was forced to have a city state form of government with Athens and Sparta and Corinth and Delphi, all independent kind of nations on their own. And then we come to the United States and Frederick Jackson Turner made the famous comment that the one thing that has molded an American is the frontier, the presence of free land in the West that you could go to. And there is a copy of a great book on the Colorado River Compact by Norris Hundley, Water and the West very critical today, and that is our second major key, water. Absolutely the lifeblood of the Gunnison country. The most cussed and discussed topic in the West, they say. Governor John Love's famous comment, water runs uphill towards money. There are two major water doctrines that we have in the nation. One of them is used east of the Mississippi River, and it's called the Doctrine of Riparian Rights. And it means that anybody can use almost any amount of water as it goes by his or her property. And of course, when you're talking about the Mississippi River and the Ohio and the Tennessee rivers that usually have tremendous volumes of water, nobody's going to worry if you take a little water out when it goes by your property. There are only two restrictions. You can't take so much water out that you stop mill wheels from operating and you can't take so much water out that you stop irrigation. So I, I would suggest that if you're talking about that kind of water, nobody's gonna worry about it. That didn't work out here in the Gunnison country in the West. And as a result in the West, we have a new water doctrine, actually an old water doctrine called the doctrine of prior appropriation. And has two rules to it. Number one is first in time, first in use. In other words, whoever has the best and oldest water rights will go dry last. And the second rule is use it or lose it. Nobody can hoard water in the arid wa area that we live in. The West and the Gunnison country right now are in the worst drought that we have seen in 1200 years. The Blue Mesa Reservoir right now is about 34% full. Lake Mead and Lake Powell even less, a very critical situation. The Gunnison River is a major tributary of the Colorado running into it at Grand Junction, and our water is salt free. Many people want it. And in the future, we're gonna to have to fight one fight after another to maintain it and keep it. The Front Range has in the past diverted over 500,000 acre feet of water from the West Slope to the East Slope. And anytime we negotiate with the Eastern Slope or the Front Range, I always like to say, their type of negotiation is what's mine and is mine and what's yours is negotiable. Water is the greatest asset that we have in the Gunnison country. It is the greatest investment that we have because its value is only going to go up in the future. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to believe that. More people, finite amount of water, it's going to get a lot more valuable. Water rights will beat any investment on the New York Stock Exchange in the future. Water is the Gunnison country's ace in the hole. But we always need to understand that those who are land rich but money poor, we have to protect. The great fights in the future over water are going to involve Southern California, Los Angeles, Phoenix, 
Las Vegas, Tucson, Lubbock, Texas. Water is good business in the Gunnison country. It deals with the environment, it deals with recreation, aesthetics, and obviously tourism. Without water, we wouldn't have much. There's not enough water to go around in the West. We're finding that out right now. The Colorado River just doesn't have enough water in it. And as a result in the future, people are gonna have to move away. The great eastward movement, I call it. Economics will usually dictate where people live. When water bills go way up, when people have to get rid of their bluegrass lawns, then they're gonna to have to move out. So if I have to tell you that you might wanna build a house out around uh, Park Meadows Mall, not far from Highlands Ranch, but I have to tell you that water rates are gonna be $25,000 a month. You might think twice about building. Everybody'd like to live in Crested Butte, but now lots sell for a million bucks and most people can't afford it. They'd like to live in Aspen with $2 million average price for a home, you can't afford it. This is already occurring. Big conservation measures are already occurring in places like Aurora, Castle Rock, and in California. And then there was a very famous court case in 1979 in California called Audubon Society versus Los Angeles, challenging the doctrine of prior appropriation. It says that rivers have rights, fish, endangered species, recreation, aesthetics have value also. So water, very important. Second key to understanding the Gunnison country. The third key involves railroads. Unfortunately, we don't have any of them anymore, but they used to be very important. Without the coming of railroads in the early 1880s, the Gunnison country would have remained an isolated wilderness because it was deep in the Rocky Mountains. The arrival of the Denver and Rio Grande in 1881 the arrival of the Denver and South Park in 1882 gave miners and ranchers an outlet for their beef and ore and brought in supplies and people. Before that time, the Gunnison country had to be sustainable. And we were, with everybody having gardens and dairy cows and beef and even fruit like strawberries and lettuce. And we even had cheese factories because we had to do that on our own. You couldn't bring it in from the outside before railroads, there was no way really of getting it in. The railroads were, as Gilbert Lathrop said in his great book, little engines run by big men and pioneered in science in the mountains. Some of the science involved flangers, narrow gauge railroads, snowsheds, helper engines, and 30 pound rails. There's a great shot of the Denver and South Park in the winter in Pitkin along Quartz Creek. There are a lot of sayings about the slowness of the railroads. On time, any time. You didn't want it to run over you because it was on you for so long. It doubles in, it doubles out, leaving the travelers still in doubt whether the engine on the track is going on or coming back. And then the famous story of a guy named Finnegan in the Gunnison country in charge of writing up wrecks. If a wreck occurred, he had to file a final report. The wreck came, filed a two-page report. His boss said, too long, boil it down. Another month went by, another wreck. This time he wrote a one-page report on the wreck. His boss again said, too long, boil it down. Three months later, another wreck, and Finnegan filed the following report. Off again, on again, gone again, Finnegan. That's about as short a report as you can make about a wreck. When the railroads left, the South Park was gone by 1910, the Denver and Rio Grande in 1955 with tracks pulled out, the Gunnison country suffered economically and psychologically. Memories, however, remain of the famous Alpine Tunnel, the highest railroad tunnel in the world, the Denver and Rio Grande coming over Marshall Pass and then through the Black Canyon, the long coal trains coming out of Crested Butte, and the lonely whistles echoing through the mountains. There's a shot of the Crested Butte Depot in a railroad car with heavy snow about 1940. The fourth major key to understanding the Gunnison country is the federal government. The federal government owns 80% of the land in the Gunnison country and 35% of the land in the state of Colorado. In the past, 
The government was considered a friend to the people here in Colorado in the West. It set the price of gold and silver high enough to where people could make money off of it. It owned the land that homesteaders took over. It built gigantic water projects. It subsidized railroads and stage lines and it gave Indian protection. Now the federal government gets a lot of criticism, but in the past, there was a lot of land and few people. Today, there's the same amount of land and a lot of people. And the federal government can't be all things to all people. Today, they got to worry about mountain bikers, ski areas, grazing, rafting, fishing, hunting, dirt bikes, and paddle boards. Didn't have much of that stuff back in the old days. The federal government is still very important in the Gunnison country and the West today. Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, Park Service, Bureau of Reclamation, Bureau of Mines, and the Soil Conservation Service. And I would submit to all of you that anybody owning 80% of the land calls a lot of the shots, and the federal government does. The fifth major key to understanding the Gunnison country is mining. And there is a great shot of Crested Butte in the 1920s with 154 coke ovens, one of the great coal mining towns in the United States. The Gunnison country has always been a great mining area. And it was the place to be in the early 1880s. And Crested Butte was called at that time the gateway to the Elk Mountains, the jumping off point to all the great silver towns around it. The miners were always very optimistic. And there was a famous story told about miner optimism about a miner who died and went to heaven. This story was told in the mining camps of Colorado very often. And the miner went up, presented his pass to St. Peter at the Golden Gate. St. Peter said, we can't take you, we're booked. And the miner said, what the hell do you mean we're booked? And St. Peter said, don't get on me. We had a big religious war in the Middle East. A lot of good people died and we don't have any room in heaven. And the miner said, I didn't come up here and abstain from all of the virtues of life, drinking and gambling and prostitution, so I could get into heaven to be told I can't get in. I want a temporary pass. And if I can go into heaven and convince one person to come out, I'm in. St. Peter said, nobody's left heaven in a million years. Miner said, shut up and give me the pass. St. <laughs> Peter thought, well, nobody's going to come out anyway, and I feel bad about it. So he gave the miner the pass. Five minutes later, 5,000 people streamed out of heaven, and they appeared to be in a fast hurry to leave. St. Peter grabbed the miner by the shoulder and said, what in the hell did you tell those people? And the miner said, what do you mean, what did I tell him? I just told him there's a big gold strike down in hell. And then the miner grabbed his knapsack and headed away from heaven. And by this time, St. Peter was hot, grabbed the miner by the shoulder and said, where the hell do you think you're going? And the miner said, what do you mean, where do you think I'm going? Haven't you heard? There's a big gold strike down in hell. Miners believed their own publicity and all you had to have was a rumor. By the early 1880s, 25 to 40,000 people flocked into the Gunnison country to mine gold and silver. Twice the number of people that live here today. They lived everywhere. They were transient, and many of them left in the winter. Pitkin, Gothic, Tin Cup, Irwin, and White Pine were all silver towns with two to 4,000 people. Many mining camps with great dreams never lasted more than a few months. They had names like Pittsburgh and Hidalgo and Schofield and Crystal and Hillerton. Gunnison and Crested Butte were the ones that survived the longest. There's a great look of Gothic in 1882, two to 4,000 people living in that area. Gunnison and Crested Butte lasted while these other towns would ultimately collapse because those two towns were supply towns, railroad towns, and smelter towns. They didn't have all their eggs in one basket. One of the great mining towns of the nation existed in the Gunnison country from the 1880s to 1952, but had nothing to do with gold and silver. And that was the great town of Crested Butte, one of the great coal towns in the West, third largest in the state, turning out bituminous anthracite and coking coal. The precious metal boom ended with the silver panic of 1893. But the Gunnison country still has large amounts of coal and copper 
and lead and marble and zinc and granite and titanium and molybdenum left. After World War II, the Gunnison country became one of the great uranium areas of the West with a huge uranium mill just outside of Hartman Rocks, milling uranium from the Los Ochos mine up Cochitope Creek. And of course, another great mining town, one of the greatest in the world was at Marble, where that stone was used in the Lincoln Memorial, Washington Monument, and the Unknown Soldier. It had the number one pure white marble in the world and is still operating today. There you get a great look at the town of uh, Smith Hill up above and anthracite down below. And that is a coal breaker and a tram. That tram is running 1,632 feet downhill on a 33% grade, four miles outside of Crested Butte along the Slate River. And one more medal. Beneath Mount Emmons outside of Crested Butte is a huge and uh, rich molybdenum deposit. This metal, a hardener of steel, has always created controversy, and the town of Crested Butte has thus far successfully fought it from being mined. In the end, the Gunnison country has been the most versatile mining area in the state and one of the most versatile in the nation. And now we come to the sixth key in the understanding of the Gunnison country, and that is the longest continuing industry we have in our area, and that's ranching, which goes back to the 1870s with men like Alonzo Hartman at the forefront. Then it was felt that a 70 day growing season would not allow farming. That was erroneous, but that's what people thought. There are some people with a rotary engine in a big snowstorm outside of Crested Butte in the 1890s, talking about the railroads a little earlier. The cattle industry grew very rapidly as ranchers made big profits by selling beef to the booming mining camps we've just mentioned. The ranchers cleared sage and willows and dug irrigation ditches that turned sagebrush into the great hay fields that we have today. The removal of the Ute Indians from the Los Pinos Reservation in 1875, the arrival of two railroads by the early 1880s meant that cattle could now get to markets. William Boo de Montrose was the first guy to ship cattle out of the Western Slope, shipping them out of Montrose on the Denver and Rio Grande to the Denver Stockyards in 1882. Ranchers also found out early they could put in gardens and be sustainable. They were able to raise carrots and onions and parsnips and potatoes and beans and peas, and even produce commercial lettuce and strawberries. The Gunnison country became famous nationwide with some of the best bred cattle in the world. Dan Thornton in 1849, the soon to be governor of Colorado from 1950 to 54, sold two bulls for $50,000 each in his dispersal sale of 1949. There's a parade going down the main drag of Gunnison and that building up there, uh, the high building still exists as does the building on the corner. That's the Bank of the West. The Gunnison country also had one of the worst cattle and sheep conflicts in the nation with both sides wanting federal land for grazing. This lasted well into the 1920s. Rancher Alonzo Hartman was asked, have you ever eaten mutton? Hartman yeah, said, yes, but I'm damned ashamed of it. Two men were expelled from the Gunnison Stock Growers Association at the turn of the century for having four domestic sheep. When they protested, Hartman said, four can grow to 400. The war ended when the federal government stepped in and an informal border was decided upon. Cattle would exist east of Cimarron and sheep would exist west of Cimarron. The cattle industry today is the oldest continuous industry in the Gunnison country. Ranching is absolutely vital to our future because of the land the ranchers control. They are vital in controlling development. They are great environmentalists and their water rights would beat any investment on Wall Street. And there in the 1890s is a horse race right down the main street of Gunnison. You can see how wide it is and obviously uh, all dirt. These were exciting days during cattlemen's days. The seventh key to understanding the Gunnison country is tourism. Tourism is the second largest industry in the state and one of the major economies of the Gunnison country. 
It's worth $15 billion in the state and worth over a billion in the Gunnison country. There's a great shot of the four and a half story high La Vida Hotel in Gunnison with the Rio Grande Railroad right by it, four cowboys riding in, that's an 1888 shot. Tourism involves skiing and hunting and fishing and rafting and mountain biking and paddle boarding and four wheelers. And they bring in about 2 million tourists a year to the Gunnison country. The Blue Mesa Reservoir with nearly a million and a half, the Black Canyon with a couple hundred thousand, and Crested Butte with about 350,000 skier days are the big three. Tourism has always been big in the Gunnison country. The Denver and Rio Grande had on the side of its engine scenic line of the West. And people love to come in and go into the Black Canyon and come over Marshall Pass. Palmer White, the editor of the Denver Post, as soon as willow flies hatched on the Gunnison River, somebody would call him from Iola and he'd be on the next train out. Great hot springs that people bathed in at Juanita and Savoia. Skiing at Pioneer and Rosman and later on at Crested Butte. And great hunting and fishing have always brought people in. One important factor with regard to tourism is the need for a great environment, clean air, a lot of water, controlled growth. That's necessary to keep the tourists coming in. It is the second biggest industry we have in our area. Number eight and sometimes overlooked, eighth key to understand the Gunnison country, electricity. We take it for granted today, but electricity didn't come to the Gunnison country, at least in most of it, until the late 1930s. Crested Butte with the CFI and Big Mine got it early in 1889. Gunnison with more people got it early too. Both towns used direct current electricity. However, direct current could only run for short distances because it loses its voltage the farther it goes. And it could only be used in towns, but not in rural areas. Then in 1891, in a little mining camp called Ames, just outside of Telluride, where the two forks of the San Miguel River came together, that all changed. Louis Nunn owned the Gold King Mine, four miles outside of Telluride. And he was losing money on that gold mine because he was costing him $500 a month to get coal up there to power the mine. And a lot of times in the winter when the railroad couldn't run or where storms hit, he couldn't even get the coal in. He's looking for a cheaper form of electricity. In that year, 1891, his brother Paul became the first trained electrical engineer in the United States, graduating from Ohio State University. And at that time, Thomas Edison's direct current was the only kind of electricity we had. And Edison was heavily invested in it. There is a great movie that just came out about two or three years ago called The Battle of the Currents. I hope all of you have a chance to see that. In 1891, I want you to remember that electricity is in its infancy. A lot of people didn't know a whole lot about it. In that year, a man named George Westinghouse was tinkering in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with an alternating current motor. And then came the most brilliant man ever in electricity, Nikola Tesla a Czechoslovakian immigrant who did things with electricity that have never been duplicated again today. So the four men now got together at Ames. Paul Nunn, the electrical engineer. Louis Nunn, the owner of the gold mine. George Westinghouse, alternating current motor. And Nikola Tesla, that great mind in electricity. The four men had a shack at Ames. And right where the Ofer Fork and the Trout Lake Fork of the San Miguel River came down, water coming downhill creates power. It hit a water wheel that they put in right inside of the shack with cups on it. And when the water hit the cups, it moved that water wheel, spun the water wheel. They then built it a generator on the side of the water wheel, strung lightweight copper wire all the way up to 12,000 feet in the Gold King Mine on top of wooden towers where George Westinghouse had an alternating current motor. They then threw the switch at the Ames power plant and power surged at 186,000 miles a second and powered the alternating current motor. Cheap electricity. 
for the first time in the history of the world, alternating current electricity was now a reality and electricity could be run long distances. And Ames today is famous all around the world. And that's why we have our power grids today and can run that electricity from one coast to another. In 1935, as part of his new deal, Franklin Roosevelt got the Rural Electric Association approved. And in the next five years, with the federal government's help, the entire Gunnison country got electricity. Just imagine living in our area and other rural areas without it. Now you had lights, now you had radio, now you had telephone, things we take for granted today. If electricity wasn't the greatest invention ever, I'd like to know what was. If you want to know the value of electricity today, turn out all your lights, turn off the TV, shut down the telephone, turn off the radio. And when it came, when darkness came, you got a lantern or you went to bed. So you went to bed in the dark and then you got up in the dark. My dad told me the greatest invention ever. A proposed hydro plant near Peanut Lake at Crested Butte was proposed in 1941 using coal and slate for power for two 335 horsepower generators, but unfortunately World War II intervened and that never came about. Without electricity, the Gunnison country would have remained an isolated region and the history of our area would have changed dramatically. The ninth key to the development of the Gunnison country natural resources. We've got more than any other area in the state. We are famous for our marble, famous for our granite. We have turned out millions of dollars of uranium and gold and silver and coal and zinc and lead and copper. And in addition, we got one of the world's great molly deposits on top of Mount Emmons. In addition, logging has always been a great resource in the past. Captain James LeCount in the 1880s floated thousands of logs down major streams to provide for railroad ties, mine props, and cabins. The Trinchera Lumber Company operated out of Sargents and Pitkin after the turn of the century for over 40 years, employing 500 men for over that 40 year period to provide for the same. Another great natural resource, perhaps the most valuable is water. The Gunnison River, as we said, are a main source of the Colorado. And another great resource is the federal land. 80% federal in the Gunnison country, allowing for ranchers and mountain bikers and skiers and boaters to flourish. And then finally, we have something we take for granted. The mountains, the flowers, the sunshine and the clean air, the scenery, which makes this a world class to be. And now as we finish up, I've given you nine keys to the understanding of the Gunnison country. And I wanna finish off with a story that might throw all of those into a cock hat. And this is the story of Samora, told by Dr. Carl Menninger in 1952 to the American Psychological Association. And if you go online, you can go ahead and uh, get it online. It's called Appointment with Samora. About the year 1000, the Muslim civilization, number one in the world, a man called the master sent his servant into Baghdad to stock up on supplies for the next month or two as he had done many times before. Servant came back very early, no supplies. Master said, how come you're back early? Where are the supplies? Servant said, I've been accosted by death in the marketplace. I gotta get out of here. I'm going to Samora a town about 20 miles away. Master said, you go to Samora, but I'm going to Baghdad, find out what in the hell went on. He did, ran into death in the marketplace and said, why did you jostle and threaten my servant in the marketplace? And death's reply was, I didn't jostle or threaten my servant in the marketplace. I merely expressed great surprise that he would be here in Baghdad today when I've got an appointment with him in Samora tomorrow. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the X factor, the unknown. There may be things happening in the future we don't know about today. And you keep that in mind. So I'll finish off. 
The Gunnison country is a special place. Eugene Field, the great Denver Post reporter, wrote about a great poem called Casey's Table Dote in the 1880s, about a place called Gold Hill up above Boulder, a great gold mining area, where I used to go to the Wentworth Hotel and drink with the miners. And then he got uh, moved over to Denver and didn't come back till about 20 years later, went up to Gold Hill and there wasn't anything there anymore. Nobody in the Wentworth Hotel and he lamented. Oh, them days on Red Ross Mountain when the skies was fair and blue, when the money flowed like liquor and the folks was brave and true. When the nights was crisp and balmy and the camp was all astir, but the joints all throwed wide open and no sheriff to demur. Oh, them days on Red Hoss Mountain in the Rockies far away. There's no such place nor time like them as I can find today. What? Though the camp is busted, I seem to see it still. A lion like I love it on that big and warty hill. And I feel a sort of yearning and a choking in my throat when I think of Red Hoss Mountain and of Casey's Table Dope. And I think that's how we feel about the great Gunnison country. And that, ladies and gentlemen, includes, uh, concludes topic number one. Now we are getting ready for the trivia question with a book on the line. And Ashley, once again, will give you how to answer. First come, first serve. So this last year, there was two chat boxes. So this year there is one. So hopefully uh, that will be easier for everybody. So I'm looking at the chat box right now. So do you want to ask the question? Okay, I'm ready to ask the questions. Everybody is ready. It's first come, first serve. Here is the trivia question. I want to know the two water doctrines, one east of the Mississippi and one west of the Mississippi River that exist in the U.S. today. First come, first serve. We're looking at the chat box. Riparian rights and prior appropriation, Catherine Keller. Oh, wait. Oh, I think, uh, who was first there? Uh, Steve, oh, that's just one. The riparian rights and prior appropriation was I Catherine, think, yep. Catherine Keller. Catherine Keller has got it. Catherine. Let me ask you, uh, you can uh, talk to us on the chat box. Do you have a copy of the Gunnison Country book? If she does, she might want to give it up and we'll go to number two. If she doesn't, she's got it. Do you want to message us, Catherine, and let us know? Let's see. Yeah, anybody else who wants oh. it? Okay, so Catherine will get it. She needs another one in Boulder. All right, folks, uh, any, any comments or any questions that you have, uh, just hit them on the chat box and I'll attempt to answer. Please sign in. And thanks for being on board. Any questions or comments? Next week, of course, we're going to have Gunnison as the topic. We're going to have a lot of uh, great pictures about Gunnison in the early days, many of them uh, you folks have not seen. Oh, Tempe liked all the new photos. Great stuff, always great. Yeah, thanks a lot for the kind comments, everybody. Uh, go ahead and comment some more. Any, uh, any questions that you have? We certainly wanna thank our sponsors, uh, Bluebird Realty, uh, KOA Dave, Dave Taylor KOA Campground in Gunnison and Cochevers. Where can I find more information on Tesla and Ames? Scott Taylor. Um, there is a great book called Lightning in His Hand, and it's by two ladies, and one of the ladies is Inez Hunt, H-U-N-T. <laughs> There's also a great movie called The Prestige, and that uh, has a lot about Nikola Tesla and blowing out the power supply Colorado Springs. If you just go online and hit Tesla, there's a couple of other really good books too. Yeah, thanks for the uh, good comments, everybody. Uh, any other comments or questions? Thank for, thanks for all of you for being on board. 
Okay. If not, that is it. We thank you, everybody. Uh, here we got some more comments. Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, we wait another second or two for some more comments. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. Yeah, Tesla did blow out all the power in Colorado Springs. He was one of the most brilliant men who ever lived, and he did things with electricity that uh, we've never been able to duplicate. He thought the earth could be a giant oscillator and electricity could be free to everybody around the world. He also believed that uh, some of his experiments were seen by people in outer space. He's a very difficult guy to get along with. Don't forget also, if you wanna see a great movie, Battle of the Currents, Edison and direct current on one hand and Tesla and alternating current on the other. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Uh, yeah, the prestige is pretty accurate. It is. Now, you know, it, it deals with uh, magicians and uh, Tesla's only a bit part in that, but very good. All right, everybody, uh, over and out, and we'll see you next Tuesday on November the 8th at 7 o'clock with Gunnison, the major topic. Thanks a lot. And don't forget, Monday, November 14th, Wayne is going to be here in person talking about the Colorado Water Compact. Yep. Colorado River Compact of 1922, 7 o'clock at the museum. Hope a lot of folks can come, and that'll be uh, on November the 14th. Yep, you can uh, register for that on our website. So hope to see you guys all there and uh, see you next week. Thank yeah. you. Thanks a lot, everybody. Good night. I'm gonna stop. How many do we have on board? Um...